Hello, I'm Stefano Mazzardo and I'm Giuseppe Giannotti and we are two members of the student committee for Fence Forum in 2040 and we are pleased to introduce you the video interview of Fence Forum speakers. Good morning. It's a really pleasure for me to introduce Dr. George Cook. His research is focused on neurobiology of drug addiction. So, please introduce yourself and tell us about your professional background. Okay, so I'm uh, George Koob. I'm the, currently the director of the National Institute on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism at the National Institutes of Health in Washington, D.C. Um, prior to joining NIH four months ago, I spent uh, uh, 40 years in San Diego, six years at the Salk Institute, and about uh, 30 years at the Scripps Research Institute, I guess it's more like 35 years in San Diego, and uh, did basic research on the neurobiology of addiction, on stress, on uh, basic circuits of emotional behavior. So please give us a preview of your lecture at Fence Forum 2040. So my lecture will probably focus on what I call the dark side of addiction. So addiction, we, we like to argue, has multiple stages. Uh, obviously involves activation of um, in, a, an intoxication, binging on drugs, taking drugs. We call that the binge intoxication stage. But when the drug wears off and you stop taking the drug, the brain's changed, and we consider that the, uh, the withdrawal negative affect stage, which sets up ultimately the preoccupation, anticipation, or craving stage. So we see three stages in addiction. My colleagues will probably be talking about some of the other stages, but I'll be focusing on the, the withdrawal negative affect stage. And the whole argument is that in, when, when you enter that stage, you lose uh, tone and, and activity in your brain reward system. But my contribution has been to show that at the same time, you activate or sensitize the brain stress system. So the brain stress systems involve neurotransmitters that control hormonal responses to stress, but they also can control behavioral responses to stress. And they include things like uh, corticotropin releasing factor, and more recently, an, an older work on norepinephrine. But more recently, uh, we've been studying uh, the opioid peptide dynorphin, which seems to produce a very aversive, dysphoric-like state and seems to be recruited during the development of dependence. So that'll be the focus of my talk. Uh, it's a, we believe it's a key part of the addiction process. We think it contributes to the compulsivity that's associated with drug taking, the loss of control in drug intake, and the misery, frankly, the misery that uh, uh, addicted individuals feel, which compels them to, to go back and take more drugs. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle, and um, this is the part that we believe it contributes uh, significantly to that vicious cycle. Well, how can drug addiction change motivational states, and how we study these changes? Well, like I said, uh, drug addiction, um, we like to say usurps, takes away your normal reward function, and, and that's often reflected in a compromised dopamine system, but certainly there are changes in opioid peptide transduction pathways and circuits. So you lose your reward system, and that produces a, a uh, what I call hypohedonic state, but at the same time, you recruit your brain stress systems, which makes you anxious and irritable and ir and, and pr probably produces sleep disturbances. Combination is, a, is very strong in dysregulating your motivational system. So in the end, while you take drugs maybe to feel better, you actually end up feeling worse. And the more you take drugs to feel better, the worse you feel. Um, it's, a, it's a very, I call it the two faces of Janus. Remember the Roman god uh, uh, of transitions. So he, the, his statue was put outside the gates of Rome. Uh, 
to ward off invaders. He was the god of transitions from peace to war and war to peace, transitions from youth to to adulthood and so on and so forth. Um, there's a two and and you know became famous with Shakespeare because of uh, Iago's betrayal. Uh, but the, the argument is that there are two sides to uh, the addiction process: the, the pleasurable effects that drive initial work uh, use, but there's also this dysregulation of the brain motivational systems that that uh, that produces it contributes ma uh, significantly to the compulsive use. How cocaine can induce negative emotional states and how this negative emotional state can be related to drug addiction? Cocaine induces negative emotional states in probably multiple ways, but the main effect of cocaine, as you know, is to block the dopamine transporter and to massively release dopamine. And that makes you feel good, at least for a while. But the problem is that the brain adapts to that massive release of dopamine. So there are multiple changes that occur. Uh, it, it, you know, it, activation of incentive salient circuits and, and in involvement in glutamatergic function. Um, Barry Everett may talk about some of that. But, but after that occurs, then the, the, uh, the massive release of dopamine can trigger changes which we argue are both within system and between system. So you can imagine uh, that the system could become depleted. In other words, you release so much dopamine, you don't have enough left to continue functioning. Um, that may or may not occur, probably occurs in very you know, severe cocaine uh, use and at the end of a binge, perhaps. It's probably more likely to occur with a drug like methamphetamine. But the second part is that we know now from the circuitry changes that when there's this massive release of dopamine impacting on the nucleus accumbens, that triggers, um, you know, cyclic AMP response element binding protein to be activated, which activates the production of dynorphin and the dynorphin feeds back and shuts off the dopamine system. So it's incredibly uh, amazing. Our brains have a mechanism for shutting off our reward system when we have too much reward. That's the way I look at it. This was early work of Bill Carlazon and Eric Nessler. But we're beginning to see that that, that dynorphin connection has functional effects. And so we believe, especially with methamphetamine, also with opiates, also with alcohol, that there is a prominent dynorphin component to the hypohedonic negative emotional state and that contributes to then drug seeking behavior as the the individual is trying to fix the problem but every time they try to fix the problem they make it worse so it's, it's quite an interesting form of what psycho psychosocial individuals have long called misregulation where you keep trying to fix the problem but you use the wrong way to do it so why should students and young neuroscientists attend to Penn's Forum 2014? Well, I looked at the program and it's a very exciting program. There, there are technical aspects that they certainly will, I'm sure, be able to learn things, optogenetics, epigenetics, uh, new techniques for activating specific circuits. These are things, of course, I'm interested in. And it's, a, it's a, exciting to see that they're penetrating into FENS. I think uh, the other uh, part is that the topic areas are broad and I always urge my students to go to a lecture that's uh, a little bit outside of their field and get a feel or, or a symposium and get a feel for how the other people are doing things and that often can help you understand your domain. So you want to profit from a meeting that's so uh, uh, Catholic in its uh, approach to neuroscience um, by looking at something outside. If you if you're a if you're a dynorphin person, you want to go move out and look at maybe some other uh, uh, neurotransmitter systems or other transduction mechanisms uh, because that can help you inform your science. And so I think a meeting like this has has those advantages. The third is, of course, is is meetings. Probably the main function of meetings is to meet colleagues, to uh, meet fellow students that you'll grow up with and, and form collaborations, meet uh, professors who 
who uh, might remember you someday for when you need tenure and so on and so forth. Thank you. So what are you most looking forward at the forum? Um, some good Italian pasta. <laughs> <That's cool. laughs> Aside from that, um, um, I, I want to see Milan too. My grandmother came from Milan, so um, so there's Italian in my blood. But I, what I'm looking most forward to is is uh, seeing my. To be honest with you, would be to see my colleagues uh, Michel Lemoyle and Barry Everett. They're good friends. They're very close friends, and I I think I'm going to enjoy the symposium. Beside that, I'm I'm uh, curious to see, like I said, some of these. Uh, uh, new techniques that are used, particularly in the neurocircuitry domain, uh, where there's a lot of emphasis here in, in the United States at NIH now in the brain initiative. So I'll be curious as to what work is being done in Europe that's parallel to the brain initiative, particularly in the area of imaging and neurocircuitry. I, I don't work in imaging, but I plan on collaborating uh, closely with Nora Volkoff here at NIH on some imaging work, m maybe even with some preclinical models. So uh, that's probably where my focus would be. Thank you. Do you want to leave a message for uh, students and young researchers? Well, you know, I'm a cup half full type of person, and I know that there's always a uh, um, the issue, and it's discussed a lot in the United States, of uh, we don't, you know, there's not enough money for research, and that, you know, it, it's going to compromise future careers. I, I think that there's a, that it's, of it, it, course, it's true right now that things are a little more tight in the United States than, than they have been in the past, but I think we will see a steady um, uh, support of neurosciences research in the United States, in Europe, throughout the world. You can see this growing. There are plenty of opportunities. Um, you know, it's a, I guess it's a, to quote our former president, George Bush, uh, stay the course. In other words, you know, stay with the program. I think, you know, it, it's, it's not always easy, but it's a wonderful life, um, you know, to, to do research. It's a privilege to do research. And um, anyone that has that privilege should, should benefit and enjoy it. Um, so don't worry, be happy and engage your work, you know. So thank you, Dr. George Ku, for your kind participation. And for everyone, please don't miss his lecture and see you at Fence Forum 2014. Bye bye.